Welcome to Pet Talk with Lisa Lawrence. Today we're going to be talking with Barb Loitz about responsible breeding. Responsible breeding is what defines purebred dog owners who promote the very best structural, healthy and sound puppies they can. I would like to uh, talk to Barb about um, and welcome her and I thank you for coming. You're welcome. Um, so basically Barb, um, let's begin with talking about a female dog and we're going to talk to the, say the proper um, word for it today and uh, try not to offend people but that's called a bitch. So um, um, basically let's start with why, thank you for saying so, let's talk about um, the um, what, a, what a breeder would do in order to get um, a, a bitch prepared or to make sure that you have a proper bitch to breed? That starts long before you ever acquire your first foundation bitch. That requires doing your pedigree research and um, finding a dog that fits the type of what you believe is the ideal standard. The standard is written and has its rules as to how a head should be, how a body should be, and you want to find the most ideal um, specimen that you can find. And once you've done that, um, then of course generally you're on a waiting list, waiting for something of that quality. Um, next step then is all your puppy socialization, uh, getting your dog ready for uh, whatever particular venues you're going to be going in. Generally a uh, well-bred dog is put into the confirmation ring to prove that confirmation, to, pr you know, to prove that there is the body there to carry the mind. And um, with that then, you start your show training, your grooming, of course, with this breed has a lot of coat and you wanna know how to properly maintain that. Um, then you move forward and start entering your shows and acquiring your points and your championship. Um, that's usually a requirement of anyone that wants to go forward with anything out of my foundation lines. And um, after that, then you've got your health testings and uh, promotion and uh, finding the proper uh, mate for that girl to then move forward. So, um, first of all, these are not miniature collies. What is this breed? This is called a Shetland Sheepdog. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, are in term miniature, but they are nothing like a collie. So what, um, can you tell me like where they stem from and uh, their original place and um, what we're looking for with a, a Sheltie or a Shetland Sheepdog? Well, um, their origin was from the Shetland Isles and they were um, a, a dog in um, small size as an all-round farm dog to, uh, you know, um, take care of the vermin around the yard, uh, keep the birds out of the trees, uh, small flocks of, of herding for sheep and, and uh, farm animals. And as things grew and, and uh, farm size grew, then they've kind of outgrown that position um, and have become more um, our companions, our uh, obedience dogs, our agility dogs, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So how intelligent are Shetland sheepdogs? I rate them up there pretty high. Um, almost human-like. Uh, they read your body language. They uh, understand a lot of words. Um, sometimes have anticipated things before you've even done them, knowing what you're, what you're doing and, and where you're headed for. So there's really nothing that they can't do uh, um, with you or a sport they can't do, to be honest, right? In all reality, no. No, I find them to be a good size for, you know, someone who likes to travel, either easy, easy to have in a crate, in a vehicle, hotel, um, any kind of uh, properties that you'd be going on. Um, and with their mannerisms, they uh, are always usually properly trained, well behaved and, and accepted into those situations very well. Mm -hmm. What colors do they come in? Well, they come in a variety of colors. The basis of, of the breed is black and sable, which is a red tone to the coat. So um, from that then comes your uh, blue merles, <coughs> which of course art is a blue merle. And um, then there's there's two merles. There is uh, what's also called a bi-blue merle, and he would that particular color would have none of the tan markings. Um, and then there is also what's called a tricolor, and that would be the black with the tan markings. And then there's what's called a bi-black, and that would be the uh, the tri-dog in essence without the tan markings and then the white is simply what what we call the icing on the cake 
um, your full white collars, your uh, white feet, your white tips on your tails, uh, maybe a white face blaze, and um, those aren't required, but it is something that does identify the breed as well. What's the other breed we have here today? Well, this is what's called an Australian cattle dog. <coughs> And in more common terms, um, we would call them a red healer or a blue healer. And this particular girl here, Mona, is um, a, what we would call a blue. And she would be a speckle because she's got the white speckling in her coat. Can you tell me um, what her accolades are? Well, this girl has, uh, um, goes back into, if we take it back to your first question about uh, foundation. Uh, my foundation, um, came from very good mentors and very good stock. So this girl is uh, the result of that uh, boy and girl that I actually did purchase. And uh, uh, so she won the uh, Australian Cattle Dog Club of Canada National Specialty in 2018. Uh, the following day, she also went on to win um, the uh, Saskatoon Working and Herding uh, specialty as well. Um, from that, that placed her as number one cattle dog in Canada, and she maintained that spot throughout the year of 2018. Wow. So she's, she's very, very um, to the standard girl. And that means temperament as well as um, posture and body, and, and so we're talking about sound, um, body, health, everything. Correct. Right. right, yeah. So when you're looking for uh, a stud dog, um, you basically look for the same characteristics? Uh, well, there are maybe things you're wanting to improve upon. Um, if, if you have someone who maybe has not as good of uh, what we would call a front, which is the assembly of the, of the shoulder and, and uh, the, the chest and, and the front legs. Now, if that was maybe lacking in your, in your bitch, your girl, mm -hmm. um, in your stud dog, you're going to look for something that maybe he outs outstanding in that area or something that you know from other litters he's produced that, that that's something, a trait that he passes on. Um, with, with, my, with my two, um, they cr did what we call cross fault. They cross faulted very well and brought out some very good traits. In, this, in, in her litter, there were um, six puppies and they've all um, done very well and all ended up to be very similar dogs. So that is also a goal in a breeding program to have something that is very consistent in a litter. <coughs> is this dog white factored? This dog um, at possibly could be white factored. Um, I have, he's had produced three litters and so far we have had no white puppies show up, um, but we do, he does carry in his um, pedigree uh, the potential to have white factoring. In now him. as a responsible breeder, uh, would you breed white factoring to white factoring normally? Uh, as a Generally not. Mm -hmm. um, knowing it, no, you don't normally go forward with it because of the fact in our uh, Canadian Kennel Cub breed standards, um, anything that is more than 50% white is not allowed in the show ring. Right. That and it can also cause health defects. Um, it, it can, it can, um, where you want to worry about that and that's where I've learned a lot from the cattle dogs which carry a dilution gene which creates um, some of the, uh, the deafness that the, the cattle dogs see in their breed. So you need to be very careful with the Shelties because of your, uh, your Merlin and your white when you start getting a lot of that white on the heads, on the ears, um, mm -hmm. it can affect and, and there are, there are <coughs> Shelties out there that do have deafness issues. Um, it's not like the cattle dogs where we health test every puppy in every litter for what's right. called a bear test, which is the hearing test. Right. Because that's not common. It's not common. Yeah. It's not so common. As a responsible breeder, you do a health check on the parents before breeding. Correct. And you, in, um, because each breed has a specific, uh, let's say, um, issue that they may be dealing with. And so you want to ensure um, things like hips, eyes, um, you know, other issues that the specific breed might have are uh, taken care of before you even breed. Correct. And that way you can guarantee it for the puppies as well. Yes, yes. There are always times where things do pop up unexpectedly, but if you've done your, if you've done your legwork and you've done your, your research and your testing, uh, your chances are so minimized that you know that anything um, that you are, you know, passing on to, to your potential puppy homes and your show homes, You've done your job, you've done the best you can to make sure you put the highest quality puppy out there for people. Right, right. Um, so, um, do you think it's important for the um, puppy 
buyers to meet the mother before they buy the puppy? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if at all possible, uh, the father of the litter too, which mm -hmm. in most cases um, isn't always, you know, possible because you may not have the male in your kennel. Right. But you need to know what that, what that mother is like because those temperaments are passed on and the way she raises her puppies is a good indicator um, of, of how well socialized your puppies will be. They've learned their manners um, and uh, of course some will be spunkier than others. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I guess that the other thing is, is um, we're going to be talking after this about how you would match a puppy with a new family and um, if the what the uh, puppy um, breeder would ask the new puppy um, family. So we'll be right back after this with Pet Talk. talk with Lisa Lawrence and our guest is Barb Loitz um, and we're talking about responsible breeding um, and the question that was um, t brought up in the last segment was um, the questions that a breeder would ask a puppy buyer so um, can you talk to me about that now well there are a few things that I like to know for starters have you owned this particular breed before um, that that's that's important because it they then have a little bit of an insight as to what they are actually looking for in a puppy um, secondly um, if you haven't owned the breed before what research have you done do you understand what the particular traits are of that breed do you know the energy level um, is it going to be a grooming issue for you? Um, those are some of the key things to start with that, that I do want to know um, about that. Um, very important for anybody that lives in a town or a city, um, fenced yard. Uh, very, very important. Um, and, you know, if you're a farm person, um, that becomes a, a different thing. I'm a farm person myself, um, but my dogs have areas that they are... Um, designated to when I am not home for safety reasons right um, that way so that is that is another very valuable uh, bit of information that I do need to know um, next question would be what uh, what do you want to do with that dog do you want to do performance sports do you want it just as a couch potato do you want to be traveling with that dog do you want to start into showing um, in the confirmation ring. Um, all of those kind of things are important because that also dictates what kind of puppy I'm going to pick for you to make sure it's best suited for you. And that's the good thing about a breeder is then, you know, you can, you can do a perfect match. Yes, yes. And sometimes um, if there's nothing that, you know, you have for that breeder from this litter, you might ask them to wait until you find something special for them in the next litter even. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've, I've had people on the other coin, side of the coin as well say, you know what, this isn't quite right. So they will wait as well. And I respect that part of it as well too because you know they want the ideal puppy. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, for instance, um, how old do um, you give your puppies to their new or, or take give yeah place your puppies with their new uh, pet homes I never like my puppies to go before at least nine or ten weeks of age um, I I prefer the Shelties to be probably 10 to 11 weeks of age before they go. The cattle dogs are of a little bit different, stronger mindset and do better when they go a little bit earlier. Um, so I do find my cattle dogs, nine weeks is probably about the right time for them to go once I've done their, their hearing tests and uh, all of their vaccinations and, and uh, wormings and, and proper socialization and weaning from mom, um, then, then they get to move forward to their new homes. <clears throat> And again, that's, you know, something that we need to note is that these dogs are um, all but guaranteed when they go to a new home. And that the, you know, what do you offer to the puppy buyer other than a guarantee um, as far as setting them up for success when they go to their new home? 
Um, well, many, many things. Um, I maybe am what some people, when they come to my place, consider over the top. Um, you go home with absolutely every bit of information I can give you from proper feeding to vaccination protocols to uh, health things you, you should watch out for, training stages, uh, s mental stages for the puppies. There are certain ages where they go through fear periods. There are certain you know things where they should be socialized at certain periods. And if you miss those key socialization areas and times, um, your puppy isn't maybe where it can get to be the potential that puppy could be um, then I am also I consider my puppies never gone from me they are 100% at any point in the lifetime you can't keep that puppy that puppy comes back to me my philosophy as a breeder is I put them on the face of this earth if they can't be looked after for their lifetime I look <coughs> after them so they don't end up in a pound absolutely absolutely yeah and and I never want th that person to feel that if they are in a troubled spot they could be moving out of the country and not able to take their dog. I don't want them to feel that they have to leave their family member with just whoever. I want to be there for them. I'm that support line. And if it's something like that, whether you need to find a groomer, whether you need to find a trainer, um, how to get into particular dog sports, um, what is a proper, what proper brushes do you use on each breed, what kind of shampoos, all of those kind of things. I'm there 24-7. I like the emails. I like the phone calls, I like the pictures, everything. That's that's just what we are as, as breeders. So um, people believe that um, good nutrition stems from the gut. So um, a lot of our guests on other shows have been saying, you know, they feed raw, um, but there's nothing wrong with kibble. What do you feed? Um, I actually feed a combination of both because I was a beef producer. Um, I had ample amounts, access to ample amounts of, of beef. So my dogs do get kibble because um, for me, it's a simplicity issue. Your vitamins, your minerals, everything are there. Those pet food companies have done their research. They know what dogs need. I like to have also the good side of it, the wholesome side of it. So they get dog soup every day, which is the, the, the meat, um, you know, rice or barley or oats and broth and veggies. And, and so they get a little bit of both. Wow, that's a lot of work. It is, but yeah. that's... A That's great it's a though. passion not work yeah yeah so <clears throat> can you tell me about the Canadian Kennel Club like what I guess the question that I'm asking is um, why do people or should they rest um, register their dogs with the CKC and are they purebred dogs if they're not registered with the CKC well, you want the C to, to have the C, they, that's our governing body. That helps us to have our guidelines, um, our rules. The, uh, the, each individual breed club um, does set out their standards of what each breed should look like. Um, the, the Kennel Club guides us with all of that as to helping to maintain that and keeping registry of uh, those dogs that are um, produced by breeders. Um, now, According to law, if they are not registered, you can't call them purebred. Um, that is a federal law, and if you are um, saying your dog is purebred, it needs to be registered. Okay, so <clears throat> what age do you register your dogs? You know, that kind of depends because <laughs> once the litter is born and everyone is healthy, first of all, the first stage of that is to register that the litter was actually produced. And with that, you get uh, a litter registration number. It says, yes, so many boys were born, so many girls were born. And at that point then, as each puppy um, <laughs> leaves my place, uh, each breeder will do it differently. As each puppy leaves my place, I give my new owners the opportunity to help name their puppy. Oh, okay. Um, and I think that makes it just more their puppy. Right. I can definitely figure out register names for all those dogs. Right. But when you get to have input, it totally becomes exactly. your puppy as well. So, so what's a kennel name? A kennel name is your logo. You know, your logo for your dogs. Um, mine being Ksenia um, has meaning for me. And most people's kennel names do have mm -hmm. meaning for them. <laughs> And that just helps to identify in pedigrees where dogs have come from, what lines they've come down um, that way. Okay, that's, um, I think it's important then that people understand why the, the first name of the dog that's registered um, is, is the, the kennel name and then they can put the rest in as the CKC registered name and then they get a call name such as Fluffy. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. All right. That makes yes. sense. Yes. Now, Barb, why is spaying and neutering so important? Well, it's for health reasons and also for um, simplicity for the owners. Um, having a boy who is always sniffing out girls because his hormones are saying to sniff out girls when you're trying to go to the dog park or you're trying to walk down the street or you know, you've gone to the hotel room for the weekend with the kids or your girls who you have no desire to become a breeder, you have no desire to breed puppies. Um, you want to take away everything that is causing any issues, any kind of seasons, and it just makes life easier. No chances then, uh, or you know, lessens your chances of your cancers with, with your reproductive organs. Right, cancers. Um, and I guess one of the things too is that um, um, then our, our boys aren't taking, running away. Yes, they're not following the smells. Yeah, and our girls aren't getting bred through a fence. Yes, yeah. yes, because yeah. as much as people don't, uh, don't understand it, girls will do anything. That is nature's way, and they yeah. will find a boy no matter what they have to when do to find When they're one. ready. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Even though they don't look like it right until the time, when it's time, they'll, they'll do yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then why is grooming so important? Well, it's the overall health of the skin that lies beneath. You need, just as you would, you know, wash and, and brush your own hair and your, your they need it as well. Um, the uh, undercoat is there for winter for insulation on this breed and for, you know, in summer as well for insulation from the heat. If that becomes <laughs> matted and oiled up and full of dirt, first of all, the hairs break off and secondly, the proper insulation for the body is not there. Some people shave these dogs. Yes. Um, is that responsible ownership? No, that is not. Right. And that's because the hair is there to protect the dog's skin. Yes. Even in the heat. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And yeah. you will never have that hair coming through that base coat yeah. properly ever again. Yeah. Without a lot of work. Um, how often should you clip a dog's nails? Well, at my house it's often because I have laminate flooring and um, the noise of click, 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 click is... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I try to make a, a habit of every week to 10 days in Good. my house yeah. to make sure yeah. that everybody's taken care of. Mine get a lot of outside time, so my nails wear down a little quicker than a dog that would strictly be a house pet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I was saying before that it's better to clip a little more often than a lot and ac accidentally hit the quick less often. Absolutely. Right. Um, so I guess the, the next thing is, is um, how often should... Um, people who get your dogs visit the veterinarian? They should, if there's any issues, obviously go. If you think that your, your, uh, your puppy is, is not eating properly, you know, maybe is just a bit off, has diarrhea, anything like that, definitely that's the first thing you should be going to. A yearly uh, examination just to make sure everything's under wraps and uh, taken care of uh, is, is important. And then you've got a baseline to maintain if something does pop up, you know what, here we were good, our weight was good, you know, our, our urine sample was good, our, you know, no worms at that time, things like it's that. It's a great way to find out if your dog is overweight or underweight too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me what, um, um, as far as going to the veterinarian, um, what they, um, like, I guess I'm asking what the, the figure that you look for in a dog would look like as far as feeling the ribs or um, the, if we, if we have a look, can you just go over your dog and tell me what we would look for? Well, for sure. Um, <coughs> I always tell people to feed by feel. Don't feed by what the bag says because the dog food company is in the market to sell dog food. So when I go over my dog, I don't necessarily look at what the number says on the scale. Uh, when I'm at the vet clinic, um, I, will f I will go over her body and I want to be able to feel each one of those ribs as I go through and know that there's, yes, there's a little bit of fat covering. You need to know whether that's coat or whether that's, that's fat covering, a little bit of body condition there. On a, a dog like Art, he's got a lot more coat, so you have to actually get those fingers in there. You have to be able to you know, get down to the, to, the, to, to the skin and feel. And so you can tell there'll be a tuck up. Mona's being a little bit of a sucky girl, so she would, would rather <laughs> snuggle. But as you look underneath um, from the side, you will notice her rib cage, and then you will notice a bit of a tuck up. And if everything there is, is uh, 
a little bit round, mm, chances are you've got a little bit more going on there than you need to if have. If she looks on. like a sausage, yes, time should, to lose some she weight. She should have a little waistline here, you know? Yeah. We'd all like a little waistline, but yeah. um, you, you need to be able to see a little bit of a waistline and then you come back to your hips. And of course, each breed, uh, there are some breeds that do have um, different specifications for what they, they are right. to look like. Yeah. But in this particular breed here, uh, she should be a very muscular dog. Um, they're very solid in bone and very solid in muscle. But through this, this area here, right. you should feel the ribs. Yes. Barb, this has been an incredible show. I thank you so much for well, all of the for wonderful information. Me. And um, for more information, or if you do uh, ever want to um, ask questions, you can uh, feel free to um, look up uh, CKC Breeders for Shelties. Um, and Barb, what's your kennel name? My kennel name is Ksenia. And uh, you can look for Sheltie or Australian Cattle Dog Breeders that way. And um, I want to thank everyone for watching Pet Talk with Lisa Lawrence this week. Um, have a good week.